Hey everyone, this video is actually based on a presentation I gave to a group of high schoolers a few months back now for a high school up in Canada. I'm in the US, so I've slightly altered this presentation to make it a little bit more US focused, although it really isn't all that country specific. It's more about how to potentially approach your finances as you get into the real world. What is money? How do you actually invest it? And what to look for as you try and build a financial future for yourself. I think it's a decent primer for someone looking to get started with with bettering their finances. So let's go ahead and dive into this finance crash course. A little bit about me, my name is Jack Duffley. I'm a commercial real estate attorney based in Chicago. Although as of this recording, I am in the middle of moving to Houston. So by the time this releases, I might already be in Houston, but regardless, I'm also a real estate investor. I own properties in a couple of states, three states now, and I run this financial YouTube channel. If you wanna learn more about investing, personal finance, and also about my legal career, if that's something you'd like to know more about. Anyways. What is money? This is a really key question to figure out where we even start because when it comes to the world of personal finance, it's ultimately a lot about dealing with money. So what is money in the first place? And it's quite simply a medium of exchange. It's something that you exchange for things that you value. And there are multiple ways to get this coveted sort of money. One of them is by trading something of value and that can be selling something. Maybe it's a product or a service or maybe it's just selling your time. The point is you're trading something of value for that money. And then you can use that money to then get something that you value. So again, it's a medium of exchange. It's really that simple. And when you have that perspective, you now understand how really a whole economy works when it comes to using money. In that, it's a bunch of transactions where people trade something of value for either money or something else of value in that you have trading taking place, whereas maybe in the ye olden days, it might have been something for something, a barter economy as we call it. Now we tend to use something like money because it's just a lot more efficient and easier to do. And one of the most common things that you will be doing for the rest of your life potentially is trading your time or some sort of service that uses your time for money. And that's really what a job is ultimately in many cases. Well, let's say you do get a job and you start bringing in some money. So what do you do next? You have some money. Well, the first step would really be to set up an emergency fund. This is where you have a f at least a few months of savings, three to 12 months. It kind of depends on what you're really comfortable with, but at least a few months of expenses saved up as cash, as money. And the reason you want to do this is because you don't know when your money might stop coming in for some reason. Maybe you lose your job. Maybe some accident happens and you have a big expense that you don't have enough money coming in that next week to take care of. So you might have to tap into those emergency savings. The point is you wanna have some savings and the greater your expenses, the greater this emergency fund should be. So that's really step number one. As soon as you start making money, work towards getting that emergency fund built up so that you're not especially vulnerable to financial challenges that might come up because they do come up and you never really know what's gonna happen. Maybe you have a family member who gets sick. Maybe something happens to you. Maybe you lose your job. All sorts of bad things can happen and they're often quite expensive. So you wanna have some savings to be able to tap into to avoid disaster. Now, after you get that set up, you want to look to opening up an investment account of some sort. We'll get back to that in a second, but maybe this is a stock brokerage account. Maybe this is a separate savings account that you use to build up cash that can be used to invest in other things like a piece of real estate or some sort of investment. But the point is you want to have some sort of place where you can have investing cash or money set aside to invest. So have something like that ready to go. And then also start tracking what you're spending and also what kind of money is coming in. You wanna see what sort of money you're actually bringing in and what sort of money is going out because that's obviously a very important consideration. You can only save as much as you're not spending. So you wanna track what your actual expenses are. And the point is you always wanna spend less than you make. So this is why you track because you wanna make sure that that last rule is true. You don't wanna be spending more than you make because that's not feasible for the long term. You can't keep doing that. You'll eventually run out of money or you're going to take out a ton of debt and then you won't be able to service that debt and then you'll be bankrupt. That's no good. So we want to make sure that this rule number one is always followed. Always spend less than you make and making sure that your cash flow position is decent and that it is always positive to some extent. Of course, maybe you'll have short-term events or maybe you'll make some big purchase that uh, to buy a home, for example, you're probably not bringing all cash to the table, so you're taking out some debt, so it's technically more than you make, but at least make sure you can meet those payments thereafter, because if you can't, you're totally in big trouble. So always spend less than you make as a general rule, and really don't forget that, because it's kind of the foundation that pretty much everything in the investment world is based off of. 
So how are rich people rich? Speaking of investing, it's a bit of a teaser. Rich people are rich for a few reasons. Let's get into it. For one, they understand this rule, the time value of money. A dollar today is worth more now than later. Why is that? Why would a dollar today be worth more today than tomorrow? What is the reason for that? You might think, oh, there's a lot of inflation going on right now, or maybe there isn't if you're watching this in the distant future, but chances are there's quite a bit of inflation because governments print more money each day. And in the case of the US dollar, there's a lot of dollars swimming around. There are more dollars each day, so there are more of them. Maybe that's why they're worth less in the future. You're getting somewhere. But really, it's the fact that over time, your money can grow when you invest it. And I guess you could say it could shrink if you don't invest it with something like inflation and that the value of it shrinks because its purchasing power goes down. It's the same sort of rule. It's a different side of the same coin. But this is the point. Your money can grow when you invest it. So money today, you'd rather have it today so you can invest it and then it can grow because then it's worth more than it is today, if, if that makes sense. You have more dollars tomorrow using that same dollar today. So that's really what the time value of money is all about. And rich people understand this. And what they do is take advantage of compound interest when they invest this money. And that's taking this rule to the next level. As your money grows, your gains also grow. So the growth grows, if that makes sense. And that leads to this compounding interest effect. The growth compounds exponentially. So you get sort of hockey stick growth because the growth is growing, then the growth on the growth is growing, and it just keeps going and going that way. And by investing your money, you give it opportunity to grow. And getting back to that time value of money rule in that a dollar today is worth more now than tomorrow. You'd rather have that same dollar today so you can invest it and it can make more. You can do more things with that dollar today and give it time to actually do, do things. That's the time value. Rich people invest their money is really the point I'm trying to get to with this whole time value money compound interest rule. We'll get back to compound interest in a second because... It's especially powerful and really important to understand. Let's talk about stocks and different types of investments that rich people might invest in. And I'm talking about rich people specifically because they would tend to know better than the average person on how to handle money because, well, they're rich. And in some cases, yeah, things are handed to people. But in many cases, you could definitely say the vast majority of cases, rich people know a thing or two about handling money and growing money. That's the reason they're rich in many cases. So anyways, stocks are one type of investment. These are shares of other people's businesses in that you can buy a share of a particular company on the open market or even in the private market, but we won't really talk about that very much. But you buy a share of a business and that is the investment as the business grows and the value of that business grows, your investment should grow as well. And you can also invest in many different businesses at the same time with something like an index fund. You maybe have heard of the S&P 500. This is a broad index of the top 500 stocks or so in the US market and there are index funds that track that track that group of stocks or index funds that track different industries but the the point is it's a big basket of a bunch of different stocks and you invest in that index fund which then invests in all the different individual companies and then as those individual companies grow your stock value in the index fund would also grow theoretically at least and that has been quite successful over the long term we'll see what happens in the future of course that's the hard thing about investing is you never really know what the future is going to hold but if we look to the past this is one thing that has made a lot of people rich. And on the flip side, index funds, you have individual stocks. Again, that's buying stocks into individual companies. An index fund is just a collection of a bunch of individual stocks in a single fund. So it's the same general premise. It's just put into a broader index. So you get some diversification in that if one stock does poorly, you'll ideally have some others that do really well. At least that's the idea. All right, moving on to other investments. Real estate is another very popular investment that rich people make. I actually own a few properties myself. I'm definitely not uber rich by any means, but I do own a few properties because you can really produce a lot of income and wealth through something like real estate. And you can do a variety of strategies. The most common that many people do is buying a property, a house, or a building, and then renting it out for income. It's that simple. It's a very simple business model. You buy the thing that someone wants to rent. And then that rent is income that offsets your expenses and what's left over is profit. So that's one way to make money in real estate. That's what we like to call cash flow. When you have cash flow coming off of the real estate, that's your profit. And that's what you can use to invest in other things or to spend and do whatever you want with. 
There's also the ability to make money in real estate by improving properties to increase their values. This is where you might fix up a property, maybe you've heard of flipping, or you actually repair the property and make it better than it was before, more valuable, more importantly, than it was before. And then you can sell that property for profit. You can maybe take some debt out against it to then go and buy more properties. The point is you build equity in that property through increasing its value, or in some cases, the market just appreciates. You have more people who wanna move into a particular area, the real estate in that area goes up in value, and that's another way to increase the value of property, although you probably have a lot less control over that as an individual investor. What you can control is the quality of the property. Maybe it has a bunch of repairs that need to be done, and then you can improve the value that way. But there are quite a few ways to make money in real estate. It doesn't just have to be houses. You have commercial buildings, office buildings, retail, industrial, farmland, land in general. There's just lots of different ways to make money in real estate, and it's a very popular investment for that reason. And there are also a number of tax benefits, which we won't really get into in this, but the uh, point is there are quite a bit of advantages to investing in real estate, just as there are advantages to investing in stocks or other things. So that's real estate. What about this other thing that many super rich people have done to a very successful degree, and that's building a business. This is kind of like investing in stocks, only in that instead of investing in someone else's business, you actually create your own, or you have a huge stake in a, in a business and then grow it from there. And this is where you simply create a service or a product, and then you sell it. And the difference between the cost and the actual sales price is your profit. The business throws off income. It's just like any other sort of investment. It has income coming in and that drives value. And the business itself has value too in addition to that income. Often it's based on the income it produces, but without getting too nuanced, the, the business itself has value too. So you can sell the business. And you see these three billionaires down here, think what you will about them, but they all got extremely rich because they built very successful businesses. And because they were so successful, they became extremely valuable. And now they can print billions of dollars essentially by selling stock whenever they want. And that's not easy to do by any means, but it's a lesson to learn nonetheless in that the way that the richest people in the world have gotten very, very rich is by building a very successful business and scaling it to a very significant level. And this isn't likely by any means, but there's something to learn here in that if you can create a really valuable business, even a fraction of what these super uber rich people down here have, um, then you'll be in pretty good shape financially because that business has value and it will throw off income in the meantime, which is really the best of both worlds when we're talking about finances. So that's one thing that rich people do. They invest and they invest in stocks, real estate, they build a business and other things as well. Those are just some of the three big categories, but they also focus on this thing right here and that's taxes. If you can keep more of your money today, you can reinvest it. Remember, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow because you can invest it. So if you can take advantage of tax deductions, things that lower your tax bill, you're gonna have more money to spend and invest today. And that's worth more than waiting till tomorrow to get that same money. So you wanna utilize deductions to get tax credits, things that help you save on taxes. Rich people do a lot of this. I mentioned real estate having deductions. That's one tool that a lot of rich people and rich hedge funds and, and things like that will use to lower tax bills. There are lots of different strategies and if, whenever it comes down to it, you want to speak with a tax expert because things get super complicated, especially in the U.S. and really any any country with a tax code. It just gets very complicated and you want to make sure you're following the rules so that you can actually take advantage of things properly and you're not in trouble, but also get the maximum deductions that you can get because you want to keep more of your money today if you can and using different tax strategies is one way to do it and that's something rich people definitely pay a lot of attention to. Now, what about debt? What do rich people think about debt? What do they use debt for? because I've already talked about how you don't want to spend more than you make, but debt can be a very powerful tool, and I want to explain how. Why use debt at all? You're borrowing someone else's money to fund something, so that's spending more than you make, like I already said. Isn't that a problem? Why would you ever want to use debt? That just sounds super dangerous, and yes, it adds some risk. We'll, we'll get back to that, but let's talk about what leverage is when it comes to debt. So I have an example here. This is uh, just a house. We'll say it's $100,000. I don't care how realistic that price is, but just for sake of example, you're buying a property for $100,000. So let's say you're using all cash. So you're going to buy this whole property using your own cash. You're not taking any debt. And that is $100,000 in cash. That means you have no debt. And let's say after 
a few years, the new value in that property uh, climbs all the way to $200,000. So huge appreciation. It's a great deal. It's doubled its price in whatever period of time. And that would mean you have a $100,000 gain, which is a 100% return on investment. And that's because it's $100,000 in profit over $100,000 invested, 100%. That's a nice return on investment, if I do say so myself, though it does kind of depend on how long it took, but that's not really the point here. So that's the cash only example. You doubled your money, you got $100,000 in profit on $100,000 invested, 100% return on investment. What about with debt? Let's take a look at what happens to the numbers. So you have the same property, it's $100,000. You have a $50,000 investment this time because you're using $50,000 in debt as well. So you're using $50,000 of your own cash and then $50,000 of, say, a bank's cash. That's the debt. So it's the same $100,000 purchase price, but you're only putting half of what you put in before. And now the new value still climbs to $200,000 over the same period of time, whatever it is. But let's see what happens to the numbers. You have the same $100,000 gain on paper, but look what happens to your return on investment. It's twice as high as before because you only put $50,000 into the deal. The other $50,000 came from the bank. So if you look at the return on investment, it's $100,000 in profit over $50,000 invested. So half the amount invested as before for the same profit. So naturally, your return on investment doubles. So that's the power of leverage in that you can really dramatically increase returns when you introduce debt into a good investment like this. But of course, it's a double-edged sword. It goes both ways. Just as it can help you, it can really hurt you. And that's why you have to be very careful with debt because just as it can make your returns explode higher, double higher, it can also bring them all the way down to zero and even beyond zero if something goes wrong because you're still obligated to pay that debt back even if the investment doesn't go right. So you have to be extremely careful when using debt. And you can see how it's very tempting, but again, it's dangerous. The dangers of debt. Simply put, you have to make payments. And the more debt you take on, the bigger the payments you're going to have. And that's going to affect your cash flow position. You're going to need more income to pay the debt. So you have to be very careful that you're not over leveraging yourself. And like I said, it helps on the way up, but it hurts on the way down because it magnifies things. Debt is not a one-way street. It is two ways. And you have to be very careful to make sure that the car doesn't U-turn and go the wrong way. So you have to make sure you watch those payments. You're not falling behind on payments. You have reserves. And you be very careful when you're dealing with debt. You want to make sure you can always make a payment even if something bad happens outside of a particular investment or even within a particular investment. You just have to be very careful. Again, it helps on the way up, but it also hurts on the way down. So you have to be very careful with debt. It does not shy rich people away from using debt in many cases, but it's just something to keep in mind and be very careful with it. How not to use debt. You don't use debt to buy unproductive assets, things that don't pay you back in some way. You don't want to over leverage yourself. Like I said, over leveraging means that you have too much debt and you can't afford it. And that if something were to go wrong, you would suddenly be underwater, as we say. The value of your debt is worth more than the investment. That's what being underwater means. And you're thus over leveraged. You're going to lose whatever it is that you bought and you're going to be in big trouble with your creditors. And it's going to be very hard to take out debt in the future and do a lot of other things. It, truth is, it just hurts. That's all I'm really trying to say. But you don't want to use debt to buy unproductive assets. We have a boat here or a, or a super fancy sports car that definitely won't hold its value, depending on what kind of car you're buying, I guess. But uh, anyways, you just want to make sure you're not buying something that doesn't produce cash flow that you couldn't otherwise afford. You just have to be very careful where you're putting that debt. Try to do a cost benefit analysis, as we say. Make sure that taking out that debt actually makes sense for your financial picture. Could you afford that debt even if the investment went south? Just pay attention very carefully before you start taking out a bunch of debt because things can really start to escalate and cause sort of a domino effect very quickly. If one debt goes bad, the next one might go bad and you're gonna have this sort of runaway effect where the debt is kind of destroying your whole financial house. You don't want that to happen. So please be very careful with where you're using debt. Okay, so we just went over all that. Investments, debt, what is money? Well, we've learned a lot already, but what can you do about it? How can you be rich? Can you become rich? Is that feasible for anyone? Well, let's take a look. First off, you have to know where you want to go. Not everyone wants to be super rich, which is fine. But what do you want in life? Take some time to think about this. Do you have family goals, travel goals, charity goals, whatever it is, try to figure out where you want to be in 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it is. Just try to have some sort of long-term goal. And then we can actually work backwards from there. 
work backwards from your goals. It's my first bullet right here. You want to have a long-term goal so that you can then make short-term goals that you can actually focus on. So the long-term goal is kind of like your motivating factor. It's what you really want in the long-term, but then because you have that long-term goal, you can now sort of make a plan, and then the plan is what you actually focus on in your day-to-day. -day. You focus on making those small steps towards the big goal. It's a lot easier to do it that way. It's a lot more feasible mentally and I guess physically to do small tasks rather than trying to do one big one because usually a big task can be divided into many small tasks. And you can keep dividing this further and further and further all the way down to daily steps. Uh, let's say if you wanna save uh, $12,000 in a year, that's $1,000 a month. That's approximately $250 a week. And bringing that down to a day, it's less than $10 a day. So that's how you can really break it down that way to try and reach savings goals or investment goals. Just work backwards. And that's the easiest way to do it. And then you just focus on tackling the $10 a day or less than that, depending on what the goal is. Or rather than trying to look at that big $12,000 number or whatever your financial goal is, scale it appropriately to whatever you're going for. And the plan can always change and it will change because life is difficult. Things change, your desires change. But the point is at least have some sort of plan going at any point so that you can actually take actionable steps towards them and you're always at least moving in a positive direction. It's very hard to do that if you don't have any sort of direction in where you're going. Now, moving on to the next slide here, we want to talk about automation. This is where you do your best to have things out of your hands. What I mean by automate is you're able to automatically transfer money places. You're able to automatically allocate your savings to different places so that you are not doing it manually and you avoid the temptation because that's a big thing with money is that it's very tempting to spend it because we have lots of things that we want as humans, lots of different things we can buy and would love to experience and they can, sure you can afford it, but is it really a good idea for your financial future? Well, let's try to take care of your financial future first. One of the easiest ways to do that is to automate. And one way to do that is to separate your investing money from your spending money. So you have a separate investing savings account and then a spending account so that you're only tempted to spend the spending account money and not your investment account money. Try to separate that as much as you can, and then automatically transfer money to your investment accounts every month before transferring to your spending accounts. It's called paying yourself first. And you can do that to take away some of that temptation to spend it, which is a big thing to pay attention to, especially when you're just starting and building up your good financial habits. Just be careful. And one way to be careful is to automate. And start as soon as possible. There's no use in waiting. You might as well start building the habits now. It's not going to get any easier when you have more money because, oh, first off, how are you going to get to more money if you don't start saving, start building those habits? But don't assume that you're just going to become a different person when you start making more money. If you do, you want to try and build those habits now and try and build that, not only the safety net, but start making positive steps towards your goals. And then when you get some big financial windfall, you start making more money, you start doing great in your career, you start doing great in your business that you're building, you start doing great with your investments, you'll have those habits already built up and you'll be able to easily take on more money and more responsibilities within your portfolio and it'll be easier to keep building from there. So just start now, even if you're only making a few hundred dollars a month, start building some habits. Put a few percentage points towards your investing account, even if you're only making a little money. Just get started, build those habits, and then it'll be exciting as all of those amounts grow as you continue to improve your income and as the portfolio continues to grow as well. So just get started. But like I was just saying, uh, you can get started with a few hundred dollars. I don't make enough money. Uh, I don't want to invest until I make more money. That's a very common excuse and it makes some sense in that Everyone always assumes they're going to make money in the future or more money in the future, which I guess is largely true. But again, if you don't get started building those habits, uh, things could get pretty ugly. But I also want to show you that you really don't need quite as much money as you think to produce some pretty amazing results. So let's take a look at a compound interest calculator. One of the favorite things for financial people to take a look at is a compound interest calculator. I encourage you to take a look, but Let's go through some examples um, and you can do some more on your own time if you want. So this is where you invest only $5 per day. That's about $1,800 per year. And I'm assuming you do $5 per day for 40 years. So that's about a career length if you start in your 20s and you retire in your 60s. And we'll talk about speeding that up a bit in, the, in a bit. But uh, this is where you're only doing $5 a day. Five bucks a day. That's it for 40 years at an 8% growth rate, which is around where the market has returned historically. So if you put this into some investment that returns 8%, which is historically pretty feasible to do, this is what would happen if you did that. 
you end up with $500,000. That's a pretty big chunk of change for $5 per day. And let's take a look at how much you actually invested. During that time, you only invested $73,000, yet you ended up with $510,000. That's compound interest right there. You put in a very small amount of money relative to the result you got. Well over five times that just in, and again, that's only with $5 a day, $73,000 invested, ended up getting you over half a million dollars. That's some pretty significant results if I do say so myself. Again, $5 a day, look what results you got to. And I'm not saying you're going to live some incredibly lavish retirement on this amount of money, but this is huge results for someone taking extremely small steps, five bucks a day. That's it. What about $10 a day? Let's double it. What happens now? You're adding $3,600 per year or just above that. And if we go ahead and run our calculator, you're now at a million dollar retirement. Hey, that's funny. It doubled the number from before. That makes a little bit of sense. You only put in $146,000, yet you ended up with over a million dollars. That's pretty crazy. I, I, I don't know if I'm just like a finance guy and I, I, I like get excited about this sort of thing, but look what you can do with $10 a day over 40 years. That's over your career, just 10 bucks a day. And you almost 10 x your money in that time, which is pretty crazy. $146,000 turned into a million dollars with a pretty pedestrian sort of approach, $10 a day, just mindlessly investing as you go along. What if we double it again? If you guys are good at math, you might notice that the amount also doubled. So now you're only investing $292,000 over those 40 years, ending up with $2 million. Double it again. You, keep, you see what keeps happening. Look at how small the number is on the left compared to the right. This is what compound interest does. You get that sort of hockey stick growth, especially towards the end of it, as the gains grow on the gains, grow on the gains, and so on. That is really what drives a lot of rich people's sort of net worths as, as they get into their careers is that they've invested for a very long time and now they're seeing the explosive growth towards the end and that's really what compound interest can do. And this is with 40 bucks a day. That's very feasible for someone with a decent salary and look at the results you can get in over a 40-year career doing that. What if you made $50,000 and you invested half of your salary? It's not always feasible depending on where you live, but for a lot of people, if you're very disciplined with it, it definitely is. And depending where you live, of course, you can always make adjustments there too. So don't act like you have to live in a particular super expensive place if you don't want to, as in many cases you don't have to. But what if you're able to save half of your salary at $50,000, which is around a median income, a median household income at least. So what would happen? Let's say you have $25,000 now, you're adding to your portfolio every single year. And look, you reached a million dollars, but look what changed. The amount of years was only 18 rather than 40 like we were doing before. So you reached that million dollar nest egg in less than half the time because you improved the amount you were actually allocating every single year, all the way up to $25,000 instead of a few thousand like we had before. So it shows you how much this can really accelerate when you start focusing more towards your investments and you can be very disciplined with your saving and investing into your portfolio. This is where we get into this concept of FIRE. Financial independence, retire early, FIRE being the acronym for that. This is what a lot of people in the finance community are striving for. They're trying to retire early. They want to reach financial independence as quickly as possible so they can quit their job if they want to. But you don't have to quit your job. But this is what this is all about. You're trying to reach financial independence. But what is financial independence? What does that mean? What it simply means is that your investments, your financial situation is enough to make it so that you don't have to work a job, you don't have to run a business if you don't want to, because your investments, your savings and all of that is enough to take care of your lifestyle indefinitely. That's what financial independence is. There are kind of varying levels of this. You can have sort of your bare bones financial independence that's just enough to just eke by in your expenses. There's another that might be to just basically spend unlimited money where you just have so much money that it's hard to spend it all. That'd be like super rich people who maybe have tons and tons of income coming in. Um, that's a bit more rare, of course, but there's all sorts of levels in between that. But at its core, financial independence means that you don't have to worry financially because your investments take care of your financial picture. That is what that means. Now, when it comes to retiring early, you have to be financially independent in some way. And this is sort of your measuring stick for kind of what amount you need to get to and how quickly you can reach financial independence just based on your savings. So let's look at this first line here. If you save 10% of your income, you save 0.11 years of expenses each year. So you save a fraction of a year if you save 10% of your income. And 
That's because you're spending 90% of your income towards your expenses. So if you wanted to maintain that standard of living, this is sort of how you calculate that rate. But what if you save 50% of your income? That means you're saving one year of expenses because you're only spending 50% of your income. And on and moving further, if you save 90% of your income, that means you're only spending 10% of your income. So you're saving nine years of expenses each year. So what I'm trying to get at here is the sort of sliding scale. As you improve your savings rate, that also means you're spending less of your income, so you sort of are less of a liability to yourself, and you're able to reach financial independence and the ability to retire early quicker because you are spending less than you make by a more significant margin, and you're able to save more in the, in the meantime because you aren't spending it, which makes sense. So it's easier to get up to that level when your savings rate is really high, and the greater you can get that, the quicker you can retire based on your current standard of living. And that's really the point here. Here. This is just summarizing what I just said. Your savings rate is the primary driver for reaching financial dependence. The lower your expenses relative to your income, the more you can save and invest, and the faster you can reach financial freedom. So if there's one thing you take away from this, at least take away this, and that your savings rate is the main driving factor for reaching financial independence, which really goes back to that sort of rule number one we were talking about at the beginning, which is always spend less than you make. That is that is a primary reason that it uh, drives financial independence because it's this sort of foundational point of having a healthy financial picture. You're spending less than you make so that you can improve the savings rate so that you can reach financial independence and you can do whatever you want. Even if you love your job, you don't have to quit it but at least you are safe from other things that might happen in your financial life. Because again, things will happen. And what if you love your job? You don't have to retire. I already said that. Financial independence gives you options. So it's definitely a worthy goal to strive for, even if you love your career, even if you love running your business, even if you love doing whatever you do. At least when you reach financial independence, you have the option to not do it if you don't want to anymore, or if something comes up that you'd rather do, if maybe there's some sort of family obligation that you need to do, then you don't need to keep staying in your job just to meet your financial obligations because you are independent, you are financially independent. So it's definitely something to strive for. Few tips to sort of wrap up this presentation here. Uh, one is to take a look at tax advantage accounts. You can look at 401ks, IRAs, HSAs, lots of different acronyms. Uh, what these accounts really do is they give you tax write-offs or some sort of tax advantage when you invest in them. So definitely look into them. They're not always appropriate depending on what your goals are, but there's something to definitely focus on. It could be a nice, easy way to get your sort of retirement nest egg started and a way to also whittle down your tax bill a bit potentially or otherwise whittle down your future tax bill if you use something like a Roth IRA. It's a bit, a bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but definitely do take a look at those. They can be very powerful tools. Track, track your expenses. Like I said before, track your income and expenses, see where money's coming in, see where it's going out. And then when you track it, you can now see what to focus on. What areas are you spending too much money on? What areas are could you potentially work on to improve your income? You want to look at all these different things and you can only start doing that when you start tracking your expenses. So do that. There are lots of apps out there. Uh, what per personal capital mint.com and many other apps out there. You can also track it yourself just by looking at your bank account or your credit card statements and all that. So just take a look at where all the money's going. You can't really do much if you don't know where things are happening. Next automatically save and invest at least 10% of your income. I would push this much higher, but at least just for me, try to invest at least 10% of your income automatically so that there's no decision to be made with it. You just automatically are investing it every single month or whenever you get paid. You have money automatically going towards your investment accounts, towards your real estate portfolio, towards whatever you're investing in. Just automatically save and invest at least 10%. You'll thank yourself a lot later if you at least get that started. If you go much higher than this, hey, remember what we said about savings rate. The more you can save, that will get you to financial dependence that much quicker. The more you can save and invest, that is a good thing to go for. And focus on the long term. It can be very tempting, especially in this very scary world, to focus on the short term. But you really want to focus on the long term because that is where you get that compound interest effect. You get those exponential gains when you wait, when you let time play things out, when you are allowed to wait when maybe an investment is doing very poorly in one year, if you have a long-term focus, you just hold and you wait for it to get out of that potentially. And you really don't give it a chance if you're selling or you have to sell 
in a downturn because there will be downturns financially, especially in the things like the stock market, real estate, stuff crashes sometimes. And if you have a long-term focus, you won't be too worried because you're investing for the long-term. So always try to have some sort of long-term edge or long-term focus where you're trying to look towards the long-term so you can actually weather the storm and, and just kind of wait out those short-term fluctuations because there will be quite a few of them. And then finally, keep learning. This is Man, it's actually might be the most important thing. I did say the savings rate was the most important thing, but I think the most important thing is to actually keep learning. You can look at things like YouTube, blogs, books, podcasts, and there are tons of other sources out there too to talk about personal finance, investing, different investing options, different strategies within different investments, uh, how to run a business, all sorts of things to keep learning, looking at history, of course, just trying to learn as much as you can, and then you'll be better equipped to take advantage of opportunities as they come up, and you'll be able to build that great financial future for yourself. And you might be a bit more knowledgeable about certain things that you enjoy too, so always keep learning. Definitely when it comes to finances, don't ignore them. If you ignore them, they're not gonna help you, so be sure that you try to focus on making sure that your financial picture is good and you're constantly improving it, because then, by the time you fast forward a few years, you're going to be in a much better position than you were otherwise, and you'll have more options and more ability to do the things that you want because you'll have more financial tools at your disposal. So keep learning. And lastly, realize that every decision has a cost. This is what we like to call opportunity cost. A decision that you don't make has a cost. A decision that you do make has a cost. Every decision or lack of a decision has a cost. The benefit that you would have had by doing something is now lost when you don't do it and vice versa. So realize that every decision you make has a cost to invest. You have the cost of potentially not being able to spend it in the meantime to not invest. Then you'd lose out on the potential gains. That becomes the cost. Again, every decision has a cost. So weigh the costs and benefits carefully. And then you'll be able to actually make the right decision. But you can't do that if you're just ignoring all costs and everything that you do. Every decision has a cost. That's for you. That's for the government. That's for anyone else. Every decision has a cost. So try to figure out the cost and then the benefit to doing that thing before you make any decision, especially when it comes to investing. Now, I had a slide for questions. We'll go ahead and have to leave them in the comments below. So that was the presentation. Definitely know what you thought of it in the comments below. And if you have any questions, definitely let me know down there as well. Otherwise, please subscribe if you haven't already. I do all sorts of content as it has to do with personal finance and investing. So I wouldn't want you guys to miss out on that. And hit the like button if you haven't already. That would go a long way towards helping the channel. But until next time, take care.